There it is in Good Morning Church family. Ah, <laughs> late night last night, huh? <laughs> Amen. Well, good to be back. And uh, what time, Pastor, do I need to be done? Not that I'm seeing a clock, okay? All right, that'll work. I'll just set that there. And uh, good to have you this morning. And trust we can be a help. Take your Bibles and let's go to Second Chronicles 36. Second Chronicles 36, you may remain seated. Uh, yes, a couple times have come through for the winter retreat, uh, thoroughly enjoyed the time with all the energy up at camp, and uh, both of those times I came alone. This time I brought my bride and my executive officer. You say executive officer, yeah, we, we travel in an aircraft carrier, otherwise known as a motorhome, and so she rides the right-hand seat, she's my XO, and uh, sorry about not bringing the Corvette, I know that's really going to cut into my love offering. But uh, I want to say sorry about not bringing it. We had to do a hot turnaround. We had to travel 1,000 miles in 26 hours to get to the coach we now have parked in Tampa and uh, take 48 hours and quickly shift gears and transfer gear and then bring this coach up. And I had no time to weld and work the, the hitch assembly to get our trailer to match it. So we're here uh, in place of the Corvette as my lovely bride, Miss Deb. And uh, you see her afterwards and she'll get to know you in our time as well. All right, 2 Chronicles 36, verse number 14. 2 Chronicles 36, 14, a very appropriate text for the days in which we live right now in America. It says, Moreover, all the chief of the priests and the people transgressed very much after all the abominations of the heathen and polluted the house of the Lord which he had hallowed in Jerusalem. And the Lord God of their father sent to them by his messengers, rising up at times and sending, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. Notice their response. But they mocked the messengers of God and despised his words and misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people till there was no remedy. Verse 17, Therefore he, the Lord, brought upon them the king of the Chaldees, who slew their young men with a sword in the house of their sanctuary, had no compassion upon young man or maiden, old man or him that stooped for age, he gave them all into his hand. And all the vessels of the house of God, great and small, the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king and of his princes, all these he brought to Babylon. And they burnt the house of God and break down the wall of Jerusalem and burnt all the palaces thereof with fire and destroyed all the goodly vessels thereof. And them that had escaped from the sword carried he away to Babylon. They were servants to him and his sons until the reign of the kingdom of Persia to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbath. For as long as she lay des desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill three score and ten years. Here in the final chapter of Second Chronicles, we see a story that's been repeated and retold for centuries. Three kings step forward on the stage and arena of life. And as we'll see, each of these kings, as they step forward, they bring with them a lesson. And the lesson is for you and for me, the living. From 2 Chronicles 36, I'd like to share with you a little thought that's very time appropriate today that I've entitled, A Tale of Three Kings. I'd like to look at A Tale of Three Kings. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for the privilege to be in your house and with your people. Lord, as we consider this story that has been told, repeated and retold for centuries, even in the days in which we live, we pray, Father, this morning that you would give us clarity of thought. Then, Lord, I ask that you would help us by your Holy Spirit's working to apply these truths to our hearts and our homes. Help us not to be hearers only, deceiving ourselves, but help us at the end of this lesson to be doers of thy word. We ask and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Take your pens out. I want to circle three verses here, if you could. There, each of these three verses contains a king in our story or tale of three kings. King number one you're going to find in verse 17. Verse 17 contains king number one. And uh, this king is the king of the Chaldees. And beside verse 17, I want you to give him a label. I want you to label him as follows. Because we're going to see, here's how he operates. He operates as a king of divine judgment. In verse 17, you're going to find a king of divine judgment. Then in verse number 22, the second king steps forward. 
And in verse 22, he's Cyrus of Persia, but you're going to see him to be a king of divine mercy. You're going to find him to operate as a king of divine mercy. And then the final king you'll find in verse 23. Actually, the very last sentence in the entire books of the kings, he's the Lord our God, and give him this label with me. I refer to him as a king of divine order. Second Chronicles 36 is where we are. And that last verse contains our third king, a king of divine order. All right, look at first king. First, the very first king we find, verse 17, is a king of divine judgment. Who is he? The Bible says, therefore he brought upon them the king of the Chaldees. He's noted by name in verse 10 as King Nebuchadnezzar. What does this Babylonian king do? Well, if you read here in verse 17, he goes ahead and he destroys old men and women. In verse 18, he goes to the house of God and he destroys the house of God. He takes everything that's holy. He flings it to his pagan empire. He burns the church house to the ground. He persecutes God's people and he literally tears God's people apart. And you read this and you know the question that comes to mind is, what in the world is he doing and why is he doing that? To understand his stepping forward on the stage of life and his treatment of God's people this way, you need to go back to Leviticus 25 with me. Leviticus 25. And you're going to find here, go back there with me, God instructing his children nationally, the Jewish people. He's giving them his commandments. And in Leviticus 25, we see one of 613 commands that God gives the nation of Israel. There aren't 10 commandments, there's 613. And notice this one concerns their land. Leviticus 25, look in verse number 2, a very specific command. He says, speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, when you come into the land which I give you, then shall the land keep a Sabbath unto the Lord. Look out for just a moment. This command is not to the Gentiles. This is very clearly to the Jew because it deals with that slice of land we know is the land of Israel. And it's a very specific Sabbath command, and it's concerning the land. Watch how it's described in verse 3. God's very specific here. Six years thou shalt sow thy field, and six years thou shalt prune thy vineyard, and gather in the fruit thereof. Watch verse 4. But in the seventh year shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the land, a Sabbath for the Lord. Thou shalt neither sow thy field nor prune thy vineyard. Verse 5, that which groweth of its own accord of the harvest, thou shalt not reap. Verse, uh, look at verse 8, thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years unto thee, seven times seven years, that's 49. Verse 9, then shalt thou cause the trumpet of the jubilee to sound on the tenth day, seventh month, day of atonement. Verse 10, ye shall hallow the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land. Now, you probably know this, but right here in Philadelphia, on your Liberty Bell, they take that verse in verse 10 and proclaim liberty. That's where they got the quote stamped in the Liberty Bell is Leviticus 25 and verse 10, proclaim liberty throughout all the land. But notice this Sabbath command to the Jewish people. God says, six years, go ahead and put seed in the ground. Six years, you can fertilize, you can till. Six years, you can harvest. But the seventh year, don't you touch the land. Don't you put one seed in the ground? Don't you even go ahead and harvest from last year's plowing? And there's always something that springs up the next spring from last year's plow under. Don't you touch it. That year is mine. Then you go seven sets of seven, 49. And on the 50th, on the day of atonement, blow the shofar, zero out everybody's debt, return the title deed back to original owner, and reset the financial machine. Boy, you wonder why they called it a jubilee. Amen. I mean, let's tell you, we did that in America right now. We called a jubilee and reset the financial machine, put everything back, declared all debts paid in full and restarted. You'd hear a shout go across our land, amen. It's as if God knew in their greed and their selfishness, they tangled the whole thing up and every 50 years it had to be reset. But the commandment was a clear command. The seventh year, don't you touch it. Look in, verse, uh, look in Leviticus 26. With the command came a warning. God seemed to know the hearts of his people. In Leviticus 26, look at the warning he gives. 
his children concerning the Sabbath of the land in verse 27 of Leviticus 26. He says, And if you will not for all this hearken unto me, but walk contrary unto me, verse 28, then I will walk contrary unto into you also in fury. And look at the extent of his judgment. I will, and I even I will chastise you seven times for your sins. Verse 29, you'll eat the flesh of your sons and daughters. Verse 30, I'll destroy your high places. Verse 31, I'll make your cities waste. Verse 32, I'll bring your land into desolation. Verse 33, I'll scatter you among the heathen. Look at verse 34. Then shall the land enjoy your Sabbath as long as it lieth desolate, and ye be in your enemy's land. Verse 35, as long as it lieth desolate, it shall rest. God said, the seventh year is mine. And if you touch that seventh year, you're going to pay me back. You know, you read that and you say, what was the big deal about the Sabbath? Well, first of all, I believe the rest of the land kept the focus on God, not materialism. There was a day in America where on, uh, in our, our Sabbath is the Lord's day. He became our eternal rest. But there was a day in America where at least one day out of the week, every business shut down and gave the financial machine a rest. I believe the rest of the land kept focus on God one year, not materialism. I believe the rest of the land was an act of faith. They had to trust God to somehow pay the bills. And listen, as a farm boy, man, I couldn't imagine letting the land sit fallow for a year. You were always scratching and clawing, trying to make ends meet. But it was an act of faith. You had to trust God to make the difference up. You couldn't just walk by sight. And I believe the rest of the land spoke of a future rest an eternal rest that was coming in a Messiah. Now, whether they understand all the ramifications, the fact that God had said, this is what I want you to do, should have been reason enough. Amen? And I often thought to myself, I wonder how they broke such a clear-cut command. I believe the same way we do. I believe one year came along, just run back in time, just go back in time. One year came along, and everybody stood down, it's the Sabbath, it's the Sabbath, and so springtime comes, and they all keep everything stored. But old Yitzhak, you know, he bought a few extra camels to close out last year. He had a pretty good bank note at the, at the Bank of Jerusalem, and, and I'm sure he thought, well, you know, it's not a good testimony to, to, to not pay my bills. Surely God would understand, and I need to have something this year. I don't have anything to pay. And I think as he put his plow in the ground that, that those around him begin to hiss, don't you do that? Don't you do that. God's going to curse you. But at the end of the year, he was doing better than they were. And I'll bet you they kind of thought, now wait a minute. Maybe this is just a spiritual meaning. Maybe this isn't really, you know, literal. And so the next seven comes and a few more try it out. And God doesn't zap them with a lightning bolt. Next seven, a few more. Wow. Man, look at this. Must, and pretty soon as an entire nation, they're selling out the commandment of God and they're willfully disobeying it. I believe that's how we do it many times. There's some clear-cut commands in God that I watch you and I as God's people violate. And then because we don't immediately get zapped, you know what we think? Well, God must not see. In fact, wow, I even got blessed in spite of my disobedience. God must not care. God does see. God does care. Do not mistake the mercy of God for his ignorance. Like a pot sitting on the stove, when the flame gets applied, it doesn't boil immediately. Amen? But it does slowly rise until it hits a magic 212, and then the process takes over. You and I, we abide in known sin, and we raise the temperature one more degree for God to deal with us. And here, his children of Israel did the same thing until finally one day, God's wrath, it had simmered for years, he had sent those to warn it boiled over in the hand of judgment, and the hand of judgment was a heathen king. Look in Jeremiah. Go to the book of Jeremiah. And notice this king of divine judgment. His name was Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. 
Look at with me in Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah. In Jeremiah chapter 27, he speaks of this king. In Jeremiah 27. And look at, look at the hand of judgment through this king. In Jeremiah 27, in verse number, uh, verse number 6. Look at how this king is described. Our first king in the tale of three kings. Notice it says in verse 6, the prophet Jeremiah is speaking, says this, the, the, he's speaking for the Lord. He says, and now, Jeremiah 27, 6, and now have I given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. Take your pen out. Underline those next two words. My servant. My servant. You say, oh, Lord, don't you understand? He hates your people. I know that, but he's my servant. Lord, don't you understand? He don't even believe in you. I know that, but he's still my servant. Lord, don't you understand? He hates everything about your people and who you are. I know that, he said, but he's still my servant. And look at this. He goes on to say this in verse 8. It shall come to pass, the nation and kingdom that doesn't serve him, that nation will I punish. There's going to be prophets in verse 9. It says, you're not supposed to listen to him. They're lying to you, verse 10. Verse 12, at the end of that verse, you serve him and you'll live. Who was this first king in this tale of three kings? He's Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. A heathen God-hater. But he was the servant of God. Raised up by God intentionally to judge those that said they belonged to God. You know, I've got a question this morning. As you and I look across America, and I served with the Marine Corps, 79 to 83. That's where I got saved. As you look across our nation, I want to ask you a question. Are you happy with the direction America's going? Spiritually? Economically? Morally? I'm not. I think I'm handing to my children a less of a nation than than I had when I was their age and my grandchildren. But let me ask you the better question. Who are you more upset with today? How some politician leads or how you live? Y'all with me? Who are you more upset with this morning? How some politician leads or how you live? Maybe the better question this morning is, how are you going to vote? Or better yet, how have you been voting? Oh, you're talking about the presidential election. No, no, no. That is an inconsequential vote compared to the daily vote every Christian has for the future of their nation. For my Bible tells me in 2 Chronicles seven fourteen, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, Seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. I'll hear from heaven. I'll forgive their sin. P.S. Icing on the cake. I'll go ahead and I'll heal their land. How you been voting when it comes to your feet? We got a conference going this week all the way through Wednesday. If you're a member of this church and you're not providentially hindered, you ought to be here. You say, well, I'm really not going to be here. You know, i got other things to do. There's some, you know, soccer practice or there's some this, you know, little league stuff or whatever. Let me tell you something. If you're saved and that's your attitude to the house of God when the doors are open, I'm going to just tell you something. You are pulling the lever against America's future. How's your, how's your vote been on the tithe and the offering and your treasure? You support missions? You even faithful given the 10% to start, which isn't even given. It's just proving you're honest because the tithe's already God's. You say, well, no, 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 no. If you look at my checkbook ledger, it's all about me. It's all about this. Uh, yeah, you know, I tip him. I re then you are, I don't care. 
You are pulling the lever if you're saved against America's future. You're asking God to curse this land, not bless it. How about soul winning? How about just witnessing and being a testimony? Track racks sit full. God's people, you can't dynamite them into even going across the street to tell somebody about Jesus. I'm telling you, we sit on our blessed assurance, and I think half the time we think we're Calvinists the way we act. Man, they work and go to hell in a handbasket. It's God's fault if you don't pick them. You kidding me? You and I are called to be watchmen on the wall. And you won't even tell somebody Jesus saves. You won't even offer them a track. You get all scared to just even get out of your comfort. You are voting against America's future. And then some of you living in known sin. Some of you men, some of you boys getting on internet sites, you got no business looking at garbage, you got no business looking at. Some of you with anger, temper problems, some of you women, you know, you just, I'm just, I don't even want to list them because if I miss yours, you think you're off the hook. But we're living in known sin, we know it's wrong, and we don't, we just live with it. And then we have the nerve to criticize politicians while we live in known sin. You're pulling the lever against America's future. You know, the keepers of this country have never been the White House, never been the courthouse, never been the state house, never been the Fed house. It's never been that. It's been the church house, your house, and my house. And we only got so much energy. And if all we're going to do is go ahead and rail on stupid politicians, and that, you say, well, politicians are stupid. Well, is that a headline? Not. That's been around forever. God, God just happens to pick different politicians and put them in to orchestrate his will. And sometimes his will is judging God's people because they're not living for God. And he's going to blow things up so we finally crawl back to him and get things right. But we only have so much energy. And if we're going to go and, and put all that energy into railing against some politician we don't like, and trust me, there's a list of mile long to pick. And we're not going to deal with the cause we only got so much energy. And if we're going to throw it to a temporary symptom, we won't have it to deal with the real cause, which is a spiritual need in our lives and our nation. Y'all with me? Y'all with me? If I was in an African-American church right now, they'd be swinging off the chandeliers, brother. They'd be going, oh, honey, you talk at it. I mean, are you with me, sister? They'd be just like, whoa, Kenny Baldwin. I could just about hear him. Man, they'd be, oh, they'd be freaking out. You're not living for God. You're not living the way God wants you to. Shame on you forever speaking to someone else. You know what the lesson is? First Peter 4, go there. We'll go to our second king. In First Peter chapter 4, here's the lesson. The lesson for you and I, the living. In 1 Peter, in chapter 4, notice what's said. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17, the Bible says, For the time has come that judgment must begin where? At the house of God. Christian, you and I should be harder on ourselves than anybody else out there. You and I should be more upset with our sin than the sins of this nation and, and some politician or some group of people. Because you and I are the keepers of this country. And if you don't like what's going on out there, it's, it's just you and I have nobody to blame but ourselves. We're getting what we deserve because we're apathetic and pathetic toward our service to our king. Amen? Amen? That's the truth. You got Bible verse to refute that, I'll go ahead and listen, but you don't have it because this is how God has always operated. He always operates through his people, and he gives them the nation and the leadership they deserve based on how they live. And America is under the judgment of God today. The first king steps forward. He judges God's people for how they live. But watch the second king. Go back to our text. And I praise the Lord it doesn't end there. I'm glad that, that in the midst of wrath, God still remembers mercy. Look at what's said in 2 Chronicles 36. Look at what's said here in, in verse number 22. In verse 21, it says this first king was brought to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbath. 2 Chronicles 36, 21. For as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill three score and ten years, 70 years. And then there's this huge space now, 70 years. And 70 years later, verse 22 says this, now. Now what? Now after 70 years of judgment. 
what happens in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord spoken by the mouth of Jeremiah might be accomplished. Look at this. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia. He made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom, put it also in writing. And what did he say? Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth hath the Lord God of heaven given me. He charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Wow. Boy, that first king steps forward. He's a king of divine judgment. But after 70 years of judgment, God raises up a second king. This king is Cyrus of Persia. You know who he is? He's a king of divine mercy. Amen? He's a king of divine mercy. Habakkuk said it in the midst of wrath. We have a God who remembers mercy. Aren't you glad we have a merciful God? He's not just a God of wrath. He's a God of mercy. And mercy tastes sweet. Does it not? How many of you have children? How many of you got children that you hadn't killed by now, all right? We have seven grandchildren with an eighth one on the way. And our oldest grandchild isn't even five yet. So, man, I'm telling you, this is fun. But I am learning this. Child rearing is for the young, all right? Grandparents just got so much energy. That's why we give them Coke and Oreo cookies and send them home. That's what we do. But I remember as a, as a, as a dad, even in that coach, that submarine, However, I'm parked, I don't even know where it is in relationship, is that way. <clears throat> I remember there were times where I had to apply the Board of Education to the seat of understanding because somebody in my crew had an attitude problem. And one nice thing about a submarine, you can close all the, the doors you want in a coach, but the whole crew gets to hear the lesson. So it's exponential in its impact, no pun intended. And I would bring them back. There were always two that were like their father, man. I'm telling you, you know which two I'm talking about. One was a daughter, one was a son telling you forever and I'd bring them back there and I'd always say okay first of all do you know why you're getting the spanking and they would know they'd always know and so they had to confess then I'd say now who's giving you this and they always in those early years would point to me I'd say I'm not, I'm not giving you this you are giving you the spanking through your attitude you are asking me to do this I don't get any pleasure out of doing doing it. I take that back there were times I did get pleasure out of doing it I'm gonna tell you one of us got relief. And then I'd go ahead, preacher, I'd go ahead, pastor, I'd, I'd say, how many swats? And they'd have to give me a reasonable number, maybe four, maybe five. We, I'll get sued one of these days, willow switch. Mm. <clears throat> and so they, they, they just say, okay, you ready? Yeah! This is going to hurt. I know! Five? Yes! I mean, they're blubbering, I ain't even touched them. And I'd go ahead, and I'd, I knew what I was going to do. I was going to show mercy. They didn't know it. And I'd do this, and they'd be like, and then i go, tap, 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 tap. And this, their eyes would just get like saucers. And they'd look back like, I'd say, that's mercy. How does that feel? <gasps> oh, that feels good, Dad. You like mercy? I love mercy. I said, don't run with that. You don't like mercy. I got real stuff. There's time God deals with us that way. I'm telling you the truth. There's been times in my Christianity, even in ministry, man, I deserve to get the ever-living devil beat out of me. And sometimes God will just for a moment remind me, you may be bad, but I'm a good and merciful God. And it's the goodness of God that leads us to repent. Do you see how good he is? And it breaks our heart and we move toward him. In the midst of wrath, God remembers mercy. I believe we have a God who's a God of a second chance. I believe he's a God of a third chance. Never the perpetual chance. Mercy runs out one day if you presume upon it. He raises up Cyrus. And who is Cyrus? You, we don't have time to look here, but if you take time to go to the prophet Isaiah... 45, you'll see 160 years before he showed up to this planet, the Holy Spirit of God calls him by name. What does that tell us? Go to Daniel 4. We're about done. In Daniel 4, look what's said here. In Daniel chapter 4, what's the lesson of our second king, this king of divine mercy? In Daniel 4, the lesson is very clearly this. In Daniel 4 and verse 17. 
Notice what's said here. Daniel 4, 17, lesson 2 from Second King. From the second king is this. This matters by the decree of the watchers, the demand by the word of the holy ones, to the intent, in other words, for this reason, that the living may know something. What do these kings collectively teach us this morning? It's this, that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will and setteth up over these kingdoms even the basest of men. You say, what's lesson two? It's a simple one. Our God reigns. Let me say this. There is no king or potentate or president that comes to power without our God's permission. I don't care how much money they put into their campaign or how much they don't. It doesn't matter. And there's no king, potentate, or power that remains in power one minute longer than our God allows. And you can visit heaven this morning. You are not going to find God wringing his hands in heaven, sucking down maylocks and popping pills and worrying about who's going to get the White House. He's got this sucker right where he wants it. He rules and deals in the kingdoms and affairs of men, and he gives them even to the basest of men. And if the father's not concerned, and if the father's not wigging out, the children shouldn't either. Amen? That's truth. We got a kingdom bigger than the United States of America. Don't look at me weird. I was a Marine. I believe America is still the greatest nation on this earth, but I'm going to tell you, heaven's way greater than America. And you and I need to live for that kingdom first, and that's how we impact this kingdom second. Amen? The second king is a king of divine mercy, and go to king number three, and we'll close with him. And king number three, go back to 2 Chronicles 36. And notice in the very last sentence of the entire books of the kings, this king number three comes forward. Notice in verse 23 of 2 Chronicles 36, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth hath the Lord God of heaven given me. He hath charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? Look at this king now. The Lord his God be with him, and let him go up. Who's this third king? He's our king. He's the Lord our God. How does he operate as I close this morning? Well, he operates not simply as the most high God. If you're saved, he's not simply your God and my God then. He's a God who brings judgment. He's a God who brings mercy. But he's also a God and king of divine order. As I close, let me explain something to you about this moment. Jerusalem was leveled 70 years earlier. You understand that? When Nebuchadnezzar left the land of Israel, he burned Jerusalem to the ground. She was a nation that if you could look at those pictures of World War II, Berlin all bombed out, I mean, that's what you had. Just, just, just literally raised, leveled, burned. She was a, a pile of rubble that had sat fallow for 70 years. Picture right now going back to Germany and rebuilding war-torn Germany 70 years after World War II ended. That's what the Jews were going back to. And let's just say you and I go back. We're standing up there looking down at Jerusalem. She sat fallow for 70 years. Everything's destroyed. Here's the question that we would all ask. Where do you start the rebuilding process? I mean, there's no buildings. There's no people. There's no walls. There's no temple. There's nothing, man. It's just a smoldering ruin. It sat for 70 years. Weeds growing through. I mean, it's just... Where do you start? I think somebody could have stepped forward and said, you know what? We need to build buildings first. We need to get the buildings up, get the engines of commerce going. King's purse only lasts so long. I think that was a legitimate, that would have been a legitimate concern. I think somebody here would have said, no, get them walls up first, man. Get them up. We need to be protected. Walls first. I mean, there's a lot of ways. But what was God's order? Go to Nehemiah. We close with this in Nehemiah 6. Watch this, 2 Chronicles, then you go Ezra and Nehemiah. Old Testament history closes out right here, by the way. In Nehemiah chapter 6, what was God's divine order for the rebuilding process? And let me say it this way. You're suffering a loss. Something's fallen apart. You didn't think should have fallen apart. Could have been your marriage. 
Could have been your plans with your family. Could have been your business. Could I don't know. Could be your emotions. They're just falling apart. Listen, that's life. Things fall apart. That's just the way life works. But how do you rebuild them? Where do you start? Notice what's said, Nehemiah 6, verse 15. So the wall was finished. Oh, that's it, the walls first. If I'm suffering loss, I need to build the walls first. Nope, there was something before the wall. Go to Ezra 6, one book earlier. Ezra 6. Ezra 6. Look at verse 15. The Bible says, and this house was finished. What house? The house of God. Oh, that's it, preacher. If my life is a mess, it's not going according to plan, I need to get back to the church house. That's good, but that isn't the ultimate place to rebuild. Go to Ezra 3, watch this. In Ezra 3, God gives the place of focus. In Ezra 3, verse 3, look what's said. He says, and they set the altar upon his bases. And they set the altar upon his bases. The altar is your personal walk with God. And could I tell you something as a 55-year-old? Life does not ever go according to your plan. It just never does. Raising a family did not go entirely according to what I expected. My marriage did not go entirely according to what I expected. Preacher building the church family and ministry, it didn't go according to the plan that you thought it would just exactly go. Y'all with me? That's just life. Welcome to the nasty mud ball. It's just what it is. And we would say in the Marines all the time, if the battle is going according to plan, you probably walked into an ambush. It just doesn't go this well. Y'all with me? It struggles. There's losses. Things fall apart. Sometimes we fall apart. And when that happens and there's a loss and a falling apart, where's the rebuilding supposed to start? It's always the altar first. Our God works from the inside out, not the outside in. You got to get back alone with your God. You got to get back alone to the place of the altar, the sacrifice of Christ. You got to get alone with him. That's where the rebuilding begins. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all that other junk you worry about, it'll get added unto you. Three kings, three lessons. That story is being retold right now in every one of our lives. May we, the living, may we learn those lessons. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.